<clears throat> so our next speaker is coming from FMC Company, uh, Brent Wolf, where he's going to talk about, um, let's see, what are you going to talk about? Your portfolio update for FMC. Perfect. Perfect. Away, Brent. Perfect. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Brent Wolf. I'm with FMC. Uh, I'm the kind of southwestern uh, retail market manager, so I cover Arizona and all the Southern California. Uh, FMC, for those of you who are not familiar with it, we're in the crop protection industry. Um, so you probably will be familiar with some of the products we're going to talk about today. Uh, Robert, thank you for arranging this and, and organizing this. Appreciate you having me in today. Um, I don't have the questions lined out, but I have the answers pretty lined out, so you should be able to know the answers to the questions as we move along. So uh, these are the topics I'm going to go through today. Hopefully I can keep you on track, maybe give you a, a few minutes back. Um, we're going to talk about Corrigin and Vanticore, or the active ingredient Rhinaxapir, Veramark Exaril, which is the active ingredient Siazapir, Avant Evo, which is a newer product for us, uh, active ingredient in Doxicard, Belief, which is Flonicum and the Mustang Max as a replacement for Mustang in the marketplace. So hopping into Corrigin, uh, Corrigin is Chloranthronilipor or Rhinaxapir. It's a group 28 anthronilic diamide. Um, this is our LEP product. It's, it's specific to lepid, Lepidopterin species control, so your warm, warm products, um, or warm pests, excuse me. Uh, it causes rapid feeding cessation, and the rates are generally three and a half to seven and a half ounces per acre. Um, it has a wide crop spectrum, so this is a very flexible product. Uh, our, our sister product to this would be now Ver, or excuse me, Vanticore for more of your field crops, so your alfalfa um, and those crops, but um, this is spe specific more to vegetable crops. Uh, has a flexibility of application and you know you go foliarly, solarly, or soil, soil applied, excuse me, or chemigated. So uh, what does what does uh, Rhinax appear do? So uh, I don't know if this has a pointer. Maybe can you guys you can't see it on the screen, can you? Um, so if you look at this cell on the left here, uh, this is a muscle cell, and, and you'll see down in the bottom it's storing calcium in the bottom. Uh, that's a Rhina, Rhina, um, they have rhinanidine receptors which control the release of calcium in and out of the muscle cell. And so what happens when you apply Corrigin or Rhinaxapir, it opens that ryanidine receptor and it causes uh, the calcium store, uh, the internally stored calcium to flood outside of the cell, uh, causing you know, rapid feeding cessation, muscle paralysis, eventually resulting in death. Um, you can see here on the right of the screen uh, the, the treated um, kind of these dark black brownish looking pests and then the untreated are the nice healthy worms there. Typically within about 72 hours you'll see mortality. Um, I'd like to put this slide up here. Um, I pulled out the competitive products just for sake of not you know, putting those on there today, but um, we did some studies. This is back in 2006, kind of when we were initially launching the product. Um, the, the number here, the key to look at is this ET50 here. This is the number of minutes basically that we were able to calculate it was taking um, a pest to stop feeding once they have ingested corrigin. So um, you're looking at seven minutes and then some other competitors in the marketplace, particularly here in Yuma, um, that get applied quite a bit. Um, you're looking at 170 and then upwards, uh, you know, over 800 minutes. So that's the, that's the key to this product is we cause rapid feeding cessation. That, that's, in this marketplace, that's a key. Um, so, you know, kind of right next here in the, uh, the use of adjuvants. Um, again, in brassicas, you want to use a high quality adjuvant. Uh, most adjuvant classifications will do fine here. There's nothing really, um, oh, they both go off. Okay. There's nothing really, um, you know, that, that you have to go one specific adjuvant or the other, but um, just a good, strong um, adjuvant will do. Um, for fruiting and leafy veggies, you, you know, to get uh, consistent control, you don't really need an adjuvant, so that's, that's a positive. Um, we do offer a little bit of white fly control with this product, um, but um, I, I wouldn't, this wouldn't be the product I would recommend in, in our portfolio for that, but um, if you did want to do that, you would want to use an MSO. Again, Corrigin is a key product in controlling various LEP species. Um, there have been some diamondback resistance questions that have been brought up in this, in this uh, kind of part of the, uh, the state here in Yuma, and particularly with John Palumbo. Um, I think it's been kind of narrowed down to one strain, a specific species of diamondback moth. Field um, info that I'm getting back from PCAs is that we're still effective on diamondback moth. Um, but again, I think there was just a couple, uh, particularly one species that John may have been able to kind of dial it down to that was showing some resistance. Um, but I think for the most part, um, we're still effective on diamondback. You may just run into a couple issues here and there. But again, other LEP species, um, other worms that you would control, army worm, um, cutworm, all those things, these are, this is a really, really good product for those um, pests. So let's get into Exeril and Veramark. Um, 
Again, Exeril Veramark Group 28, so it's an anthranilic diamide. I mentioned that with Corgin, Group 28. Um, so Corgin, or Rhinax size, Pure Corgin, and Exeril Veramark are in the Group 28 classification of chemistries. Uh, so Exeril and Veramark are Siazapir, is the active. Um, this is a more flexible product for us. So this is where Corgin's gonna be war more warm specific. This is gonna have a broader spectrum label. So you're gonna have a wide range of pests on Corgin and Veramark. Um, key for the here, another question you might see on your, on your um, in your uh, test questions or whatever they're calling them. Um, Veramark is soil applied and x is gonna be our foliarly applied product. So when you look at our products, if you're trying to remember which one is which, x goes um, foliarly, Veramark is our soil applied product. Typically, um, Veramark gets applied at the greenhouse. So what I say as a pure active control, right? I said it's pretty, pretty flexible. Well, it picks up a bunch of worm species, including diamondback moth, army worm, all those. Um, but it also picks up white fly, aphids, thrips, um, does a really good job um, on all these different pests. So let's hop into Veramark Insect Control. Again, it's designed for soil applications. Um, the biggest thing here that I like to point out is this, sorry, this doesn't work, the, 30, the greater than 30 day control. So Veramark, when applied correctly in a greenhouse prior to planting, will provide over 30 days control. I talked to different PCAs and they're telling me they're getting up to 45 days control with an application of Veramark. And that's gonna be whitefly, that's gonna be worms. Um, so that's, that's an important product for us in this marketplace. It's growing rapidly. Um, again, this is gonna be a really good diamondback product as well if you get this product on in the greenhouse. Uh, the rates are generally five to 13 and a half ounce acres, or ounces per acre, excuse me. Um, what we do though, when we calculate that at the greenhouse is we're looking how many plants are gonna be planted in that acre, and then we would apply that rate to those number of plants in the greenhouse. So that's how that would be done in a greenhouse setting. Um, the key here though is, is when you put this on, you wanna allow it about one to three days for translocation. So in the greenhouse setting, no issues, right? We, we put it on, those plants may be transplanted a few days later, but if you're making a soil application in the field, we'd wanna, and you already have um, some plants kind of um, you know, above ground, you'd wanna get something on that new growth just to protect it um, because it is gonna take a few days for, for Veramark to, to translocate. So these are some tests that were done um, several years ago uh, prior to FMC obtaining the product from DuPont, um, which is now uh, Corteva. On the left, you can see we did a 13 and a half ounce shank injection uh, versus the right side here on some cauliflower. It might be hard to see in the pictures, but you can tell on these, these ones on the right um, versus Admire Pro. Um, they just look healthier on the left. The ones on the right, you can see some of the feeding damage as you get closer to the picture, but it's probably hard for you all to see in the, in the classroom here. Uh, these are some studies we did on cabbage looper, diamondback moth, and beet army worm years ago. Um, as you go across the bar, so basically the left, would, the green bar would be 28 days after treatment. Um, then you go to the baby blues, 35, up to 42, and that's for um, cabbage looper, and then diamondback moth is gonna be your grays and yellow. So you can see here, um, where Veramark is and then Corrigin and then Meyer Pro and the untreated check. Veramark clearly stands out as, as kind of a really solid product for these pests, um, including the 42 days out right after application, you're still getting really, really good control on both pests. This is another trial, Cabbage Looper Diamondback Moth again um, that we did in Madeira. Um, same thing here. If you look from left to right, you're looking at 28 days to 35 days to 42 days on Cabbage Looper and Diamondback again. Um, again, this just drives home the point that Veramark, when used properly, put in the ground early, um, it's gonna do a really good job. I'm gonna skip past that one for sake of time. Uh, we'll get into x -Rail. Again, size appears, so it's the same active ingredient as, as Veramark. Uh, again, group 28 insecticide or uh, IRAC classification in the anthranilic diamide group. Uh, th again, this offers broad spectrum, so wide range of piercing and sucking pests versus chloranthranilla pearl. Like I mentioned earlier with Corrigin, which is more warm specific, I position this product in this marketplace against other com um, competitive products that have a wider range. So I know sometimes Corrigin gets lumped into some of the, uh, with Radiant, some of these other products that control a wider range of pests, Corrigin's not gonna do that. Where we like to look at it is x can do that. Um, x you can put down by air, um, veggies, cucurbit, citrus, that kind of, um, those are some of the crops on the label. Uh, we wanna go at five gallons um, on veggie crops and then 10 gallons in your fruit crops. Uh, there is a statement on the label, we don't wanna make any aerial applications within 50 feet of, of bodies of water. 
Uh, we do have a pollinate, pollinator statement. What I would say on pollinators for any product that I, I uh, represent, um, I would tell you that um, we just want to be cautious if there's bees present. I would encourage you if you're fully applying a product, put it on at night. That way you don't have to worry about it the next day. Um, obviously there are some products that stick around a little longer that can be moved on the bee, but um, most of our products, if you apply them prior to bees foraging in the field, you're going to be in a, in a pretty good position. Uh, for best performance with this product, you want to use an adjuvant, um, so like an oil and, and water emulsion um, as well. Again, Veramark is designed for soil applications, x is designed for foliar applications. Labeled rates go from 7 to 20 and a half ounces. I know that's a pretty broad range. A lot of the products, a lot of x down here gets applied at 13 and a half ounces, um, but for you know, for heavy infestations, if you're going after um, a, a tougher to control pest, you know, you definitely want to get up in the 20 and a half ounce rate. Um, on x we do have one day PHI and 12 hour REI. So again, x is an excellent tank uh, rotational partner. Um, it provides outstanding and extended crop protection. Um, you know, the formulation again is designed for foliar um, uptake and it performs well when compared in the marketplace to other LEP materials and also thrips materials, white fly materials, and such. Just wanted to come back to this again, uh, reiterate again on size up here, because, because I do want to drive home the point that uh, x is not just a, a warm material, it is a much more flexible product for us than just being a LEP material. Uh, here's a nice little um, chart that kind of John Palumbo put together here in 2021. So if you look at it, you can see Corge and Besiege in red, you could see um, in the yellow, Proclaim, in the green, um, Radiant Trust, blue, the Veramark Drench, and then x and Gray. So um, this is a performance rating that John Palumbo put together for Diamondback Moth Control. Uh, again, you can see here where uh, in 2016, Diamondback Moth Control for Corrigin and Besieges was not great. Um, it's come to up above three for John, so that's kind of um, still a, a, a good rating for him. Um, but you can see at the top of the, the list, um, you know, where you apply Veramark as a drench, in the greenhouse, it's a top performer, and then x has also done a really good job. So um, I thought this was pretty good, positive um, feedback for, for what we were up against, I guess, with Corgin. But if you look at all the products in this, in this chart, they're all performing good or above good, right? So they're, they're better than good. Um, so uh, what that means, we do have good, good products in the marketplace that you can rotate to um, when you need to, and, and that's an important thing. So let's hop into Avant Evo. I think I'm doing okay on time. So Avant Evo is a new and improved um, in Docs Carb formulation for FMC. Some of you may have been familiar with Avant that we had in the marketplace. We also have Steward uh, for Alfalfa is a big, big market for, for us. Um, but Avant Evo is now going to be replacing Avant in this, in this market. So um, what, is a, what is in Docs Carb? So basically it's a sodium channel blocker. Um, so you can see the nerve sections on the left are open. The sodium is flowing freely into the so, uh, into the nerve on the right, you, after you've applied indox carb, it blocks those sodium channels and basically the pest is, is um, paralyzed pretty quickly and then stops feeding. So these are some other pests outside of worms. So um, typically Avant Evo is a, is a worm, diamondback moth, army worm material, um, but we do have other pests. Uh, I know um, Stewart goes in like alfalfa weevil, we use a lot of Stewart on alfalfa weevil, does a really good job there. That's not going to apply to, um, you know, the vegetable market, but that's a that's a market we we do really well in. Um, we had some late ligus pressure a few years ago, um, and this did a good job as well there. So Avant versus Avant Evo, I guess. What are the differences, right? They're both in docs carb. They're both dispersible granules. They both have a caution label. They're both Group 22 insecticides. Uh, where you'll see a difference is we have raised the rate uh, of Avant Evo in, in some veggie crops, except spinach, up to six ounces. Um, pest spectrum is still the same, PHI is still the same, REI is still the same. Um, the one thing I would encourage with this, with this product, it, it does take a little bit of time before you actually see pests falling off the plant dead. So if you're getting close to a, a harvest date, um, I wouldn't recommend going to an Avant Evo. We want to be uh, a little further out, that way we see dead pests falling off the plant. So that's, that's just a, a watch out from some of the feedback I've gotten from the field on this. Um, hopefully you guys can see that and it's not blurred. Um, but here's uh, the leafy green vegetables except spinach and spinach varieties, uh, the difference in the label. So on the top is going to be Avant, and now down on the bottom we've gone up to six ounces in Avant Evo for Cabbage Looper. 
And then here's leafy petioles. So you can see we've gone from three and a half. Now we've got a range three and a half to six. A little difference between the two products. So there is a packaging difference. So uh, we've gone from a 10 by 18 ounce to an 8 by 30 uh, ounce packaging. Uh, the rates, uh, the, the pricing, excuse me, at the six ounce rate is still competitive. Um, and we are looking at some higher rate opportunities as well in the marketplace. Jumping into belief for flonicamid, um, this is a sister product to carbine. So carbine gets sprayed a lot in cotton. Um, this would be our vegetable product. Uh, it's a pyridine carboxamide classification. It's a group 29 uh, cordotonal organ modulator product. Um, so basically what it does, it acts on the cordotonal, cordotonal excuse me, organs. Um, and basically that just helps the pest de detect their position of their body on the plant. I'll show you here in a, in a little video. I hope it'll play. Um, and you'll kind of be able to see that and what that looks like. It works via contact and ingestion. So here's some aphid pests. Um, typically this, this product once um, ingested or comes in contact with the pest, um, within a half hour about they start, uh, they stop feeding. Um, so let's see, hopefully this will should play. But if you watch uh, the really large pest there in the middle or aphid in the middle, you can see his legs are kind of kicking out or her legs are kicking out kind of awkwardly. Um, basically what they're trying to do is detect where they're at on the plant. And because their legs are kicking awkwardly, that's a sign that they've ingested or come in contact with flonicamid. And so we know that pest has now been in, in, infected or in, impacted by an application of flonicamid. So um, if you ever, you know, the pest will hang around a little while, but if you get your loop out, your lens out, and you take a little quick look at them, and you can see how awkwardly they're, they're shaking their back legs, they're just trying to figure out where they're at on the leaf tissue. And so at that point, their stylets become flaccid and they can't, can't, um, can no longer penetrate the leaf tissue. And so they, they're, now not impacting the, the quality of your, of your crop. So um, belief as a label, um, again, it's a group 29 um, IRAC mode of action. Uh, half pound flunicamid per product is exactly the same as carbine. Um, offers translaminar control. It's excellent for aphid and ligus. This is a really, really good product for us in aphid and ligus. Uh, this would be, again, our veggie product. You can go um, foliar, foliarly, excuse me, by ground or air. Uh, we recommend 10 gallons by ground and three gallons by air. Um, rates currently are up to 2.8 ounces. Uh, we do have a new drip section in our label for uh, cucurbits that offers up to 4.28 ounces, excuse me. And uh, I believe there's a question in the, the questionnaire um, for PHI on belief is zero day, and that's gonna be in most veggies. There's a couple odd liars, some root vegetables that have a different PHI, but for the sake of, of this marketplace, zero day is gonna be your PHI. Um, we are looking at some new opportunities coming soon. We're doing some studies. We, look, um, we actually had a positive impact on um, thrips and INSV along the coast in Salinas. Um, we do, I just got confirmation for those who are checking alfalfa. I did just get a confirmation we're gonna have a 14 day PHI in alfalfa versus a 62 day prior is what we had um, after, before, I guess we got approved. Yesterday I got the confirmation, so. Prior to last week, let's say, we had a 62-day PHI, which is, was, was not feasible in the alfalfa market. Now we have 14 days. But in veggies, zero-day PHI. Uh, this is a chart that John Palumbo put together. He may put this up later today. I'm not sure. Um, but this is a really good visual for you all um, to understand kind of what products fit in what spaces for aphid. Uh, the one thing I will say about belief is we're probably not the best on red aphid, right? We're, we're just kind of, um, we're not great on it. We do okay. But if you're in a red aphid situation, I would tell you there's probably some other products that um, this chart kind of has on them that would do better. But if you look at the other spectrum of aphid, we are in the green on, on all other uh, aphid pests. So um, pretty good chart. I hope John puts it up, but uh, um, I just wanted to put that up there so you all could see it. We're um, belief down here in the bottom. Okay, last topic. Uh, we'll try to get through this one quick. Uh, Mustang, some of you may, may be familiar with Mustang. We had it in the marketplace up until 2000 and late 2019, I guess. Uh, we're no longer in production of Mustang. We've replaced it now with Mustang Max. Um, okay, so what is the difference? So uh, Mustang Max has 9.15% active ingredient per gallon versus 17.1% Zeta Cypermethrin per gallon of Mustang. So it's about half the active ingredient per gallon uh, still has about the same REIs on all label crops, so it's 12 hours. Still has the same PHIs, most of them are one day. Uh, our rates have changed, so 2.24 to 4 ounces is our Mustang Max rate, 
Whereas in Mustang, we were 2.2 or 2.4, excuse me, to 4.3. You may be wondering, well, you have half the half the active ingredient per gallon in your new product, and your rates are lower. How does that work? So I'm not a chemist by trade, but the way I understand it is we we're able to utilize one isomer when we were built um, Mustang Max that did the same work of four isomers in Mustang. Um, I've had this product in the marketplace for about 18 months or so. It's come on really strong. It's doing a really good job. Um, so there's been no performance drop off. I actually have some um, PCAs telling me that they're seeing a better um, control in their crops with Mustang Max versus Mustang even. So um, that's exciting for us. Again, this is a this has got a broad label. Uh, we don't offer in quarts. I don't know if that's important to everybody in this room, but um, some it might be. Uh, we only offer it in gallons right now. So again, performance is on par with Mustang. I've, I've heard it works better. Uh, this is an EC formulation, uh, whereas Mustang was an EW formulation. So um, I know there were some initial concerns over Fido. No issues so far. I haven't seen any problems. Uh, again, we are 100% now in the Mustang Max business, including California. Um, again, if you're worried about any issues of compatibility, um, you know, FIDO issues, you know, try to do a test strip, do jar tests with your tank mixes to, to confirm. Um, we have some two EEs in place. I know this is a, a big deal for us. Uh, if you're exporting into Canada, broccoli, Brussels sprout, Brussels sprout excuse me, cabbage or cauliflower, uh, you do have to put this product on 14 days prior to harvest. So that will keep you under the MRL needed to get into Canada. Um, prior to this, we, there were some no spray lists for Mustang. Well, FMC came out and said, hey, if you, if you apply it by our 2EE, you're going to be in the clear when you go to Canada. So that's broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower. And then the next one will be celery and lettuce. You have to be 30 days out I'll buy this 2EE. So a little difference there, 14 days or 30 days. But um, we do have an opportunity, uh, if you're exporting to Canada, to get this product on. So that wraps it up for me. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No? Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Brent got us right on time. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I'm taking uh, Junior Evans' place. Junior Evans is our territory manager covering uh, Yuma County also covers Southern California and Hawaii. Uh, I am the field scientist covering this territory. I cover the western half of New Mexico, all of Arizona, uh, Southern California, and Hawaii. So I have an opportunity to stand here and, and represent uh, Junior today. So um, let's see if I can make this. There we go. So we're going to start off talking about Curb SC, which has been become a very popular herbicide and lettuce here in the Yuma area it provides excellent weed control, uh, controls more weed species than any other herbicide in lettuce, uh, has excellent crop safety, it's very economical and flexible pre-harvest intervals and rates. So it has both pre and early post-emergence weed control. Um, it controls some small, small weeds and broadleaves must be very young, either cotyledonary stage uh, or younger, and grasses must be in the first true leaf or smaller. All right, so you remember previously, there was a few years where we lost uh, curb for leaf lettuce, and when we got the, le uh, the, the, le the label back, we had a tremendously more flexible label than we had previously. Originally, all of our pre-harvest intervals for both head and leaf lettuce were 55 days. When we got the label back, we had this, uh, this new uh, structure where you can have different uh, PHIs de de depending on the uh, rate that's applied. And so you can have as short as 25 or up to 55 days uh, for leaf lettuce. So when our label first came out, this is what we had for the timing on um, application, which was early one to three days, mid-season three to six days, late season five to six days is when you would um, chemigate with curb. Since then, we've discovered that one of the things that you can do is really focus your attention not so much on the days after, after you put on your sprinkler, uh, after you put on your germination water, but if you focus more on the phenology of the lettuce plant. And so when your lettuce plant is at the crookneck stage, 
chances are your weeds are at about that same stage. And that is the most sensitive stage for weeds to be killed by curb. So that's kind of where most people are now looking. Instead of counting the days, they're looking at the phenology of the lettuce plant. So this is kind of what we're looking at. We want to get it just before the cotyledonary leaves emerge or just after the cotyledonary uh, leaves emerge. So some application tips when it comes to chemigating curb. Apply uh, during the final five to six hours of irrigation, assuming that your sprinklers are set to one-tenth of an inch of water per hour. So injection time should be between 60 and 90 minutes, again, if you're at one-tenth of an inch. And then you run the sprinkler for another four to five hours to evenly distribute uh, curb through the, um, through the germination profile. Rate range is one and a quarter to two and a half uh, pints per acre. And again, to reiterate, uh, so basically if you're gonna put it on for the last half inch of water, one tenth of inch of that should be uh, chemigation, and four tenths should be the incorporation step. You should consider the soil type, weed pressure, and other uh, herbicides that are applied, and timing of application as well as lettuce variety when it comes to when it comes to dialing in on these different uh, curb rates. But for most applications, it's going to be somewhere between 1.7 and 2.25 pints for both head and leaf leaf lettuce. Um, if you're going to be applying after the crop starts to emerge, you might consider using little, uh, slightly higher uh, rates. So this has become increasingly popular is to take the um, rate that you would normally apply and split it into two different um, applications. And so if you're going to do a split shot, the first shot should be at the normal recommended timing at that crook neck stage using about one and a quarter to 1.6 pints, and then you apply the second shot about three to seven days later. I think usually about four days is probably the average. So wait at least three plus days after the first shot to ensure best crop safety. Don't exceed 2.5 pints um, total. So if you're doing a split shot uh, on leaf lettuce, your PHI is your total rate, not just a single rate. So you would think, oh, I, maybe I'm only putting on 1.25 pints on one of the applications. Well, guess what? You're still at 45-day um, PHI, not 25-day PHI. Head lettuce, again, is 55 days for all rates. So the split shot has become quite popular under certain conditions. One would be under heavy weed pressure. Another one would be where lower rates are preferred for whatever reason. Also a new field with unknown weed history and it will also depend on the time of year and the weed spectrum. So we do have some curb respirator language, personal protective equipment, uh, coveralls over short sleeve shirt or short pants, waterproof gloves, chemical resistant footwear plus socks, chemical resistant headgear for overhead exposure, and chemical resistant apron when cleaning equipment, mixing, or loading. In addition, a minimum of a NIOSH approved particulate filtering face piece respirator with any NR or P filter or a NIOSH approved elastomeric particulate respirator, say that three times fast, with any NR or P filter must be worn by mixers and loaders for aerial and mixers and loaders not, use, uh, not using a closed system for use in chemigation. So again, to kind of reiterate what I just described, but in a kind of a graphic form, if you're going to do a split application, your first application would probably be in this early crook stage, and your second application would be late crook stage or when you're first starting to see cotyledonary leaves on the lettuce seedlings. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Radiant SC and Entrust. Um, both of these products, so Radiant is our second generation Spinosin, and Trust is our first generation Spinosin. And so uh, and Trust is our organic offering and Radiant is our conventional offering. Both of these products have translaminar activity. Both of them are labeled on nearly every major crop that's grown here in the Yuma area. There are minimal PPE requirements. Um, minimal environmental impact, minimal impact on natural enemies, 
Uh, both products have a very short pre-harvest interval and a short re-entry interval. I believe the re-entry interval for both products are, is four hours. So we talk about short pre-harvest interval. It's one day PHI for all coal and leafy, one day for bulb vegetables, one day for sweet corn, one day for fruiting veg, one day for herbs, and three days for cucurbits. So if you look at the, if you look at the um, radiant label uh, by insect, you'll see that the, the rate range on the label says five to 10 ounces for leps and six to 10 ounces for leaf miners and thrips. We like to kind of dial that down more to saying, you should be here in Yuma, you should be applying, if you're going after leps, five to six ounces. And if you're going for uh, leaf miners or thrips, mainly for thrips, seven to nine ounces. So there's no need to go to 10 ounces, certainly on, on leps and not on, even not on thrips here as well. So we, we found out from the very earliest times that this product does have a sensitivity to pH. When you go at extremely low pre-harvest, uh, when you go to extremely low pH um, levels on your spray tank pH, then you're going to shorten substantially the residual activity of either radiant or in trust. So we wanna keep the pH between six and nine is the preferred pH range. You'll get great knock, if you're below that six, uh, that pH of six, you'll get great knockdown, but zero residual activity. And it's very noticeable if you make this mistake. Don't make more than two consecutive applications of either radiant or in trust. Uh, rotate to another class of effective insecticides for at least one application. Can apply by ground or air. It's a minimum of three uh, gallons by air and um, five gallons uh, by ground. But we recommend five by air and 10 to 30 by ground. Don't apply to, uh, directly to foraging bees. Once this, one of the things that we have uh, noticed is that once you have the spinosin where you have spray dried residues, there's no impact, no impact on um, pollinators. So that's it for the spinosins. Now let's move to isoclast. Isoclast is our uh, trademark AI name describing both transform and sequoia. So you'll also hear the term sulfoxiflor to describe the active ingredient. This is the first insecticidal molecule from our um, sulfoxamine class of chemistry. It was discovered by Dow AgriSciences uh, scientists. We didn't buy it from some other company. It's proprietary chemistry with our company. It controls sap feeding insect pests and it's effective ag against a broad uh, spectrum of, of sucking insects, including aphids, ligus, scales, mealybugs, white flies, and more. It, it exhibits complex and unique interactions with the insect nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and these are distinct from other um, insecticides that might be in the same uh, uh, group, like um, neonicotinoids. It's the only active ingredient in IRAC group 4C. Neonics are 4A, so keep that in mind. There's also a lack of cross resistance with insecticides in other IRAC groups and subgroups, including neonicotinoids. Also, we have done from, from laboratory work, we know that there is a difference in metabolism of sulfoxiflora compared to the neonix. So some of the fe key features of, of isoclast, it's pretty fast acting. In fact, if you actually hit the insect with a droplet, it's dead within an hour. Um, however, it's also systemic. And so if the insect is not hit with a droplet and it has to go systemic, it could take two days for aphids or up to six days for ligus. Has a unique uh, mode of action a minimal impact on beneficials and effective at very low use rates. We have a very uh, broad label for sequoia it's registered on uh, brassica vegetables, fruiting vegetables, leafy veg, palm, stone and tree nuts and pistachios, the small fruit vine climbing group except for fuzzy kiwi fruit and low growing berry except for strawberry. This is for this is for Sequoia CA, okay? So, California, so Sequoia CA is registered for both California and Arizona. 
We also have Sequoia, and this can be confusing because we have Sequoia CA and Sequoia. Both of them are registered in Arizona, but they're slightly different. The rate range uh, for Sequoia and the Arizona version is uh, one and a half to two ounces. Um, Whitefly is, is higher, uh, thrip suppression at 5.75 ounces. And all crops indicates do not apply three days prior to bloom until after petal fall. Sequoia CA, also one and a half to two ounces. Leaf hoppers, mealy bugs, and plant bugs, 2.75 to, to 5.75. Whitefly, four and a quarter to 5.75. And then Thrips and San Jose scale uh, suppression only 5.75. And when it comes to grapes and fruiting vegetables, do not apply this product until after petal fall. I challenge you to find petals on a grape or in a grape uh, vineyard. <laughs> Sequoia CA is not registered for crops grown for seed. We do have some interesting things happening right now. In fact, as we speak, we have a, a very important regulatory um, activity going on right now. There's an, a biological evaluation. Uh, an EPA assesses potential effects on labeled use of a pesticide on listed species and their critical habitat in, in accordance to the Endangered Species Act. So if EPA finds a pesticide may affect such species and their habitat, consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and or the National Marine Fisheries Service may be required. So right now, EPA is assessing the effects of aerial application on certain crops, and they're considering in increasing buffer zones up to 300 feet for some of these labels. So if you find 300 feet to be an unacceptable buffer zone, you might want to take some time to write a comment to EPA and let them know that that is not acceptable. We are already getting quite a response from several growers, from several university collaborators on this to, um, to put a comment on the docket uh, in, case, in case you find 300 feet to be an unacceptable um, buffer zone for an application of either Jesse, transformers. Do you have a general um, generic one that you can just send out and have people sign, growers or applicators sign? Let's talk afterwards. Yeah, there is some good. If you might look on the internet, there should be some. There's some things that uh, Corteva has has posted on the internet to help you on this. But I can also help you. I can send you an email as well. So here's what you can do: provide a public comment. The comment. Period closes September 17th. That's pretty, pretty soon. And here is the link if you want to take a picture. Now I'm going to talk about Reclamel Active, which is our new um, uh, nematicide that we're going to be launching. Uh, we anticipate registration the fourth quarter of this year. So fourth quarter of 2022. This is the most exciting molecule that I've gotten to work with since 2013. And I think it's going to be an amazing product. It's called Celebro, but you'll also hear the term Reclamel Active used to describe it. So when you think about life, we have um, visible threats and we have invisible threats. A visible and threat would be somebody putting a gun in your gut and saying, give me your money. An invisible threat would be uh, maybe a hacker. Uh, hacking into your social media or into your bank account or your um, your home, whatever. Uh, in in IPM, we also have visible threats and invisible threats. And a visible threat would be something like a lep larvae on um, on a tomato. But an invisible threat, or almost invisible, would be nematodes. They can be incredibly high in numbers, and they can be very devastating in the impact, although we rare, rarely can see them unless we have a high magnification. So what is Celebro? It's a novel nematicide. It's a true nematicide. Some nematicides are really more like nematostats, but this product actually kills nematodes. It acts, it acts by contact with the nematodes as they are living in the soil poor water. They show a significant decrease in activity and mobility and the ability to penetrate and infect uh, plant roots within 24 hours. Root protection is rapid. Uh, there's a wide range of application methods and timing, and I'm going to talk about that. It's highly compatible with a soil health preservation program, and I'm going to talk about that as well. 
It's a key component of an integrated nematode management program. I'm going to skip this. So if you look at when you think about quick knockdown, when you're thinking about insecticides, you probably think about 24 hours. Well, this is a nematicide, not an insecticide, and it doesn't kill in 24 hours, but it's pretty rapid. It's about a four-day process. On day one, you get reduced motility and activity and, and these abnormal gestures. It's what we describe as the um, J shape or the Z shape. Normally, uh, nematodes, if you've ever looked at uh, worms, they have what we call a sinusoidal movement. And, and nematodes are just microscopic roundworms. And so almost immediately after being intoxicated, they stop making that sinusoidal movement. And they have these strange, strange gestures. So we see this within 24 hours, reduced motility and activity and abnormal gesture, reduced mobility and infectivity. Within uh, two to four days, total paralysis and loss of infectivity. And within about four days, uh, nematode death. So I mentioned before that one of the things that's going to distinguish this product from other nematicides is the, is the range of application um, methods. Um, by the time we get our, our second tier of registrations, all of these will be possible to apply this product. Pre-plant, at-plant, post-plant, drip, micro-sprinklers, overhead chemigation, and soil drench. The first label that's going to come in the fourth quarter of this year will not contain overhead sprinkler chemigation. But everything else, I haven't seen the label, but everything else should be on that label. Here's some slides. Oli Becker and Anton Plug, a nematologist at UC Riverside, are very high on this product. Um, this shows what the untreated check looked like in one of the trials that they conducted. And here's the Celebro treatment on carrots. Uh, here's a cucurbit trial actually looking at cucumbers, the untreated on the left, and then Celebro at 15.4 ounces followed by 15.4 ounces 30 days later. It's one, of those, it's one of these nematicides where you actually can see above ground what's happening under, underneath. Here is a trial on um, almonds in the Central Valley. On the left we have Celebro at a pound. On the right is the untreated check. This is on the third leaf see a huge difference in the plant health. Um, I talked about soil health compatibility. The one thing that's going to be, an, another thing that's going to make this product very unique in addition to the myriad ways that you can apply it, is that the only thing that it kills is plant parasitic nematodes. If you were to take a cubic foot of soil in, an, in, in a field and extract all the nematodes, the minority of the nematodes would be plant parasitic nematodes. Most of them would be either beneficial nematodes or neutral nematodes. This product has no activity on those beneficial nematodes and on the neutral nematodes, nor does it have activity on any beneficial fungi or bacteria, which makes it quite unique. So it's an effective true nematicide, no impact on beneficial, but we're starting to see some pretty interesting things. The first one is Eutricia N. It's a naturally derived live bacteria. The Latin name is Methylobacterium symbioticum. It actually fixes nitrogen from the air and converts it to nitrogen in the leaf. It's, a, it's foliar applied and enters the plant through stomata, colonizing, uh, colonizing and, making, uh, and uh, making the plant tissue its habitat. Nitrogen in the air is converted into ammonium, resulting in a constant, immediate supply of amino acids. Speaking of entering into the stomata, um, how does let's see how does Nutricia N work? It enters through the stomata and quickly colonizes the plant and converts uh, N2 from the air into ammonium, and um, it provides a constant supply of amino acids can be used alongside conventional fertilizers as a supplement, uh, reduces nitrogen dependency from the soil, it stays with the plant as it grows. So as you have new leaves come out, it colonizes the new leaves as well as the old ones. It won't overproduce nitrogen and it is OMRI certified. Uh, these are some of the labeled crops that we anticipate, <laughs> expected for California. Uh, Trees, uh, tree crops, grapes, field and row crops, and vegetable crops. And 
This should look familiar to you. This happens all the time. It's registered right now in all states except for California. So we anticipate that uh, California will be coming soon. Our next product is Bexfon. This is a pretty interesting product. It's another one that uh, I looked at and I said, okay, I'll, I'm willing to test it. Let's see what it does. And um, it's a pretty interesting product. These are the labeled crops, cucurbit vegetables, fruiting vegetables, legume vegetables, leafy veg, root and tuber, berries and small fruit. And this is some, this is some of the disease spectra that we anticipate, uh, verticillium, phytophthora, fusarium, rhizoctonia, scab, uh, sclerotinia, and erwinia. So I'm just going to talk about some of the features and benefits. It, it, uh, it has protection against soil-borne pathogens, improves plant vig uh, growth and vigor, stronger plants have increased tolerance toward abi abiotic and biotic stressors. It's tank mix compatible with most agrochemical and plant nutrition products. It works in a wide range of application methods and complements traditional chemistries and fits within integrated plant protection strategies. And it's certified organic. So this is how it works. Um, it colonizes the root zone to form a protective biobarrier, suppresses soil-borne pathogens through competition and production in antifungal, of antifungal punk, uh, compounds. Suppresses growth of plant pathogenic bacteria and fungi. And when it comes to plant vigor, it leads to faster emergence that helps support fast plant growth. So as you can see from these pictures, you put it on uh, at close to planting. As the root structure develops, the, uh, the, the Bexfon, the, 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 um, the product continues to grow with the growth of the roots. Application recommendations apply preventatively before the onset of disease. Apply via drench to seedlings uh, prior to planting, at planting, or immediately after planting. Ide ideally via um, infero spray or chemigation. Those would be the, the two pre preferred ways to apply it. Rates vary by application method and crop. See the label. Um, typical rate will be 7 to 14 ounces is the label rate range. Storage, we do have to be a little bit care careful with storage. It's a liquid formulation, but it needs to be stored in a cool, dry place below 77 uh, degrees Fahrenheit for up to three years. I'm quickly running out of time. I think I may skip this slide, just show some efficacy data. This is, this is not dated, uh, generated by um, Corteva, but this was uh, in Europe. Here we have, um, this is a lettuce trial. On the, on the top, you see percent of dead plants at harvest. Here we have the untreated control at 30% of the plants are dead. With a trichoderma product, it's 15% approximately. With Bex Fond at uh, 7 fluid ounces and Bex Fond at 14 ounces, both of them you have less than 5% of the plants that have succumbed to diseases. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one too. Um, I just want, the last thing I want to mention is, this is interesting. I guess I'm kind of coming across as maybe not completely convinced that I, uh, uh, well, how do I say this in a nice way? Um, when, I, when I hear about new biologicals, I'm always a little bit suspicious. The scientist in me is, tends to be a little suspicious. So as I'm seeing more and more data, I'm becoming increasingly convinced that there really is something to these products. Eutricia is definitely fixing nitrogen. I've seen that from the data we've done this year. Uh, Bexfon definitely has, has an impact. We got an email yesterday from Steve Koike. He had just finished a trial that he had done. It was a Petri dish trial where he had incorporated Bexfon into the media and then inoculated with four different species of, of plant pathogens. Uh, Botrytis, Rhizoctonia, Sclerotinia, and Pythium. And the first thing he said in his email, I was surprised at how well it suppressed fungal growth, which to me is substantial, a substantial statement from someone as respected as Steve Koike. So I do think that we're, we're learning along with you. These are new in our portfolio. But the more data that I see and the more experience we have, the more I'm being convinced that there really is something to these, these uh, biological products. And with that, it's just about lunchtime. Any, any questions? 
good enough. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be presenting remotely, uh, Dr. Bindu uh, Padel. Uh, actually, Bindu Padel Ward, sorry. <laughs> it's going to be, it's always hard for me to do, to remember the last word. But, it's okay. <laughs> uh, she's our uh, uh, plant pathologist here and plant diagnostician um, here at uh, Yuma Agricultural Center. And today she's going to be giving us an update and talking to us about uh, Yuma plant pathology fungicide trials that were conducted in uh, 2021 and 22. Uh, so without further ado, Bindu, take it away. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bindu Podel. Today we will talk about the fungicide trial that we do. Um, I run the plant pathology program, or we have a plant disease diagnostic, where we do field as well as clinical diagnostic, and we do a lot of applied research that um, uh, that is um, more best uh, based on what uh, what the growers and you know PCAs are going through at the moment. And then we do all, the major part of our trial is we do a lot of field trial. Um, starting with the outline of the project, we will talk, of course, about the results of the field trial. Um, we'll talk about start with fusarium oil, um, lettuce powdery mildew, downy mildew, uh, scolotinia, also known as lettuce drop, spinach downy mildew, uh, and melon powdery mildew. And we'll talk a little bit for the industry people uh, attending. We'll talk about the associate fees and timelines for the protocols and the results. So looking at the, the, taking a quick look at the disease triangle, we have the host, right? Or we can have resistant varieties or alternate varieties. We can have transgenic plants, or we can focus on plant vigor to manage disease. We have the environment where we can do different things like culture method, preventative spray, vector management, alternative host, et cetera. So for the pathogen, one of the major disease management practices that we do is use a fungicide. So this is what we'll be talking about today, uh, about the fungicide trials. For the trial setup, uh, we have, unless it is listed in my report, it's usually um, uh, happens in the, in the valley farm. Uh, our soil is silt clay loam. Um, let me see if I can hide the thumbnail. Okay. Um, and uh, sand silt clay. For latest, we have rows that um, plant let us double rows, 12 inch apart, 40, 42 inch between bed centers. Our plot size is 25 feet uh, with 42 inch uh, between bed centers. So for the trials, we have the untreated, um, untreated um, control, which is pretty much a plot or a replication where we are not applying anything. So we have trials where we're doing about fungi, uh, um, fungicides, but then we always should have one treatment that is untreated. Um, untreated control, so we know that how, so, so we know the difference, what would happen to the crop, you know, if we're not applying fungicides. For most of the um, treatments, we do four replication. Um, that is the result that we try to get uh, to the industry people as well as you. You guys, usually when we do it, we do five replication. So just in case something goes wrong, we still have four replication. And then we have untreated bed between treated beds um, as control. So Unless you ask us to not to use surfactant, we use surfactant in our product. Can anybody tell me what does a surfactant do? So it uh, um, reduces the surface tension and then it, uh, it helps your chemical to stay on the leaf rather than just rolling down. So surfactant are usually, um, uh, usually, um, um, applied in most of the trials, unless there are, uh, you are doing, um, someone is dealing with a normal product and they're still doing experimentation and they ask us not to do the surfactant. Otherwise, it is usually um, a default. For all the application, um, we do with tractor mounted boom sprayer, 50 gallon per acre at 100 psi. Um, we do either for irrigation or, or rainwater, unless it's specified. There are some, some, uh, 
um, some fungicide trials where we were, were um, they request us to do uh, the sprinkler irrigation, um, but unless it is specified, it is um, for irrigation. So, and for any treatment we do, uh, if there's any phy phytotoxicity observed, phytotoxicity is when we apply chemical on a plant and instead of just killing the pathogen or insect, it also tries to kill the plant, you know, or there is chemical damage. So that is phytotoxicity being phyto meaning plant and yeah. toxicity being toxic to the plant. So if there's any chemical, we do not want that because we do not want them to kill the plant, right? So if there's any kind of phytotoxicity, we always uh, make sure we note it and let you guys know. For all the results and reports, apart from the newsletter, we also submit to a plant disease management report so you can access the data uh, anytime from there. So just to give you an idea about how we do our trials, let's see, let's think of A, B, C, D as different treatments. So let's think that A, A is untreated control and these are different fungicides that we are using. So we do the randomized club, uh, complete block design where we have at least four replicates. So we're doing A is here, A is here, A is here. A is here, A is here. So at least in five places. So, uh, you know, like sometimes you can see in the field that um, certain uh, certain um, certain uh, chemical does great. But then unless we know for sure that you do it five times or four times and it still works, we cannot be sure that, you know, of, about its efficacy. So we always make sure that we do at least four to five um, replication in five different blogs. Starting with fusarium oil. Um, as you all know, it is one of the most common diseases that we have, especially in the early season. Uh, this particular trial, we always do at JV farms. Uh, we do not have uh, uh, we do not have um, a land in the egg center where we have um, a few sarium oil of lettuce so far. So all we do is um, most of in the trial is we look at the germination rate. And then after we count how many plants actually germinated, and then we have we count the infected plants. Uh, most of the trial that we're doing here is uh, is funded by the specialty crop block grant, so it is uh, based on soil amendments. And we also have some uh, we'll do some experiments on our early um, product development, which is a uh, uh, number of compounds. For the twenty twenty one trial, uh, we had the best result uh, from Rhyme and Stargus. Um, moving on to okay, any questions so far in this one? Okay, moving to downy mildew, we do both our preventative as well as curative sprays. Uh, we uh, apply um, the fungicide uh, uh, every seven to ten days, uh, three to five sprays. So there are you when you look at the results um, in the newsletter or at the at the plant disease management report, you would see that we are applying um, back to back. So this is not something that you should be doing. We are doing it as a research to look at the efficacy. Um, so we do have some uh, treatment that we're, we're rotating fungicide, but when you are doing in the field, you should always um, rotate the rotated fungicide so you do not have a resistance. This project is partially funded by the Arizona Iceberg uh, Latest Research Council. So we got to do it in three different varieties. So we'll have the results for the three different varieties. When we do the disease scoring, uh, we just look at the plant, uh, the plots, and this is how we do it. Zero, the number zero means no downy mildew present. 0 0.5 means one to few um, very uh, small downy mildew colonies present on the leaves. One is downy mildew present on the bottom of the leaves. Um, so this is just, um, you know, this is how we read it. So I'm not going to read all of that because we need to keep moving. Uh, but by the way, if you need this slide, uh, I can always um, email it to you. And this is also, this is also available in all the, all, all the trial report that we do. So it is, it is listed there. So we did that on three different varieties. For uh, Magosa, this is the result we have. The best results we got was from Zampro. CBA, um, uh, this CBA two are in different rates that that we applied. Um, again, all that data is um, is in the newsletter, or you can just ask me, and I can email you. And we did get good red results with uh, Tumorex ACT and Ranman, uh, and then also Rebus. On Bobcat, we got the best results with Zampro and CBA, and then um, Tumorex ACT and Ranman. So fairly similar. Um, on the variety one eighty. Uh, which uh, we tried this year, um, that was really good against town in Maldives. So this is more like a varietal result that we have than the fungicide result. 
we didn't see any downy mildew at all in that um in that variety. I think it is distributed by basil seeds. So this worked out really well. We're gonna do it, repeat it this year to see, you know, if it was just last year or if we get to get the same result this year as well. Moving on to powdery mildew uh, in letters, uh, the the application schedule are is fairly similar, and this is scoring is also fairly similar. So I am going to just skip through this so we can discuss the results. Usually, uh, we need uh, we look at, when we're looking at these numbers here. If the head's infection is more than forty percent uh, powdery mildew present, then you they are usually rejected in the market. So uh, scoring is very important. Um, the results are pretty pretty obvious, and we had actually uh, have good products in market that are very uh, effective at um, at managing powdery mildew. Luna experience was phenomenal. Luna sensation was phenomenal. So and then we have CBM or even. Uh, these two are experimental compounds that will be in the market uh, pretty soon. Um, I just can't say the name right now, but when they come in the market, you can always go back to the data and uh, it will relate as UA experimental three or experimental two when you are looking at the at the product later. Moving on to the scotinia drop, we all know we this is usually said as all or nothing disease. Sometimes you have the disease in the field, and if you have a resistant variety, you do not get the the disease, but then sometimes you have a susceptible variety and your fill is all dead in a matter of a week or so. So natural disease infection is pretty unpredictable. So we actually prepare the inoculum of the of the fungi in the lab for both the species and then we inoculate them in each plot. So we use 3.6 gram of sclerogenia minor and 0.5 pint of sclerosherum. The reason is that the the difference in this size, um, in this weight uh, or volume, is because sclerotinia minor has very small, um, small sclerotinia, sclerotinia, and then uh, sclerosherum has much bigger sclerotinia. So, and then the plant date from sclerotinia drop are counted, and then um, they are changed to percentage with the total plant plants. Um, the control, the untreated control in this case, is we will introduce the inoculum. To the to those plots, but we will not treat with any fungicide. Remember, on UTC, untreated control means no fungicide treatment. For Scotinia minor, we had pretty good results with Indura, uh, UEA two, the that is experimental two, uh, um, in two different rates. For Scolarium, we still uh, we again had good results with Indura. Uh, we had pretty good results with Chivia, and we also had uh, you know good results with the, the experimental products that we've been testing. Uh, moving on to the spinach downy mildew, it is a slightly different setup uh, because it's a spinach and not lettuce. So we have 84 inch between bed centers, 30 lines of seed per bed, and 15 feet long separated by three feet long on treated bed. We spray using the backpack sprayer at a 50 gallon per acre at 40 psi. Uh, and this plant is sprinkler irrig irrigated. The spray schedule is fairly similar or comparable. Uh, seven to 10 days, three to five sprays. Again, when you do it, you have to rotate it. The disease scoring is, uh, is done and the percentage of infected leaves present within the one square feet. So number of spinach leaves in one square feet is approximately 144 uh, leaves. So we will count the number of uh, plants number of leaves that have um, the infection and change it to percentage. For 2022 trial, uh, Orondis Ultra um, did really good. We had no downy mildew and uh, the rotation of ActiGuard region, reverse region um, also did pretty good. Moving on to the powdery mildew in Melon. This is the last trial we do every year um, uh, that we end in summer. Um, the trial setup includes seven, 84 inches uh, between bed center 25 feet long bed, um, we do um, seven to 10 days, three to five sprays, uh, and we do the disease scoring. So for disease scoring from each plot, so we have five plot for each, uh, each treatment. So for UTC and for untreated control, we have five plots. For um, suppose queen take, we have five plots. So from each plot, we take 10 plants and um, each replicate is rated, uh, zero means no powder mildew, one to one to uh, two, um, two mildew colonies and leaves, Powder mildew present in one quarter leaves. Three is powder mildew um, present in half of the leaves. Four is powder mildew present in more than half of the leaf surface area. And five is powder mildew present in the entire leaf. So rating uh, transformed to the to the leaves infected. For um, 
2022, um, we had really good products. Um, um, Luna Sensation Regalia worked really well with a uh, Quintec worked really well. We have Quintec um, alone, just working just as good. We have Torino that worked good, and we have this different rotation that worked pretty good as well. So moving on to the fees. Um, um, for the efficacy trial, we have fifteen hundred dollars per treatment. Um, if you have a, if a special requirement like soil testing, drone pictures, ill data, etc., uh, we have um, uh, we will have extra fees that we discuss depending on the um, depending on you know what we're supposed to do. For the timeline um, for fusarium, we need the protocols by July uh, and material by August, and then we do planting on um, on September. Uh, for latest powdery mildew, uh, downy mildew, scotinia, we need the protocols by mid-October. We plant mid-November. And unless it's a treatment that requires to be uh, treated, uh, you know, while planting, we, we do thinning in early January and then start our spray treatment. For the spinach, uh, you know, we need the protocols by December and we plant late January. For melons, we need protocols by mid-February and plant late March. So the first results we provide with the raw data uh, or replicate data and as well as simple statistics. And uh, you can do, um, you can make it, you can do whatever you want with the, your data. So for all these results, Martini is the person that does, uh, you know, pretty much all of our field trial. I put together all those numbers and, uh, you know, protocols for him and he, he, he does a trial. For any, uh, any questions you have on the plant diagnostic, uh, I recommend that you go, uh, you just have to do uh, Google like Arizona Plant Diagnostic Network and then uh, you, this will lead you to the different labs um, where you can choose um, or you can decide where your plants should go. Uh, you can send it to my lab, you can send it to Alex's lab or a different lab um, for, in I mean, they're, depending on if it's plant pathology or entomology or nematodes. For the sample uh, in the lab, we, we request that you send us good example, you know, uh, multiple plants with different techniques and always fill out the submission form as much as you can. I know it's not fun to do, but the more information you give us, the easier it is for us to do the, um, do the diagnosis. If you are mailing, uh, uh, mailing the samples, please make sure that you include the USDA APIs permit, especially if you are um, out of state. So that is all I have. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Bindu. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next speaker is a relatively new addition to uh, University of Arizona here in Yuma, uh, Dr. Najira Singh who is a postdoc with Bindu in plant pathology. And today she's gonna to talk to us about the ep ep epidemiological, <laughs> I got it, I just had to say it slower, okay? Studies to manage impatient necrotic spot virus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you want to advance you? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, though uh, Robert has already introduced me, but uh, I will briefly introduce myself. I am uh, Nirja Singh. After completing my PhD, I, uh, hope, uh, am I like loud enough? Okay. So uh, after completing my PhD from uh, University of Delhi, India, I joined Dr. Podel's lab as a postdoctoral research associate uh, last year in October. Title of my today's presentation is Epidemiology of Outbreaks of Impatience Necrotic Spot Virus Orthotospovirus in Arizona. Outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will talk about a uh, little bit about viruses in journal. Moving on to INSV, then uh, its background, host range, uh, when the disease started showing up in the desert, then I will talk about uh, INSV project, which I am doing as a part of my postdoctoral training in plant pathology program. Then I will end with INSV management. So uh, what are uh, viruses? A virus is a submicroscopic biological entity with a nucleoprotein constitu constitution. 
lacking cellular organization unlike other uh, biological organisms they uh, do not have uh, cellular organization but uh, they are capable of replicating exclusively within the host cells. Uh, we all know that all living organisms are uh, made up of cells, but uh, this statement is uh, not true about uh, viruses because uh, they are not uh, made up of cells, but uh, they are autonomous uh, genetic systems uh, built up of uh, nucleic acids and uh, proteins uh, because they evolve, their uh, evolution is uh, fast. They are uh, obligate parasites that can reproduce only inside a host cell. And unlike cellular organisms that uh, reproduce, make new copies by uh, binary fission, they, they divide, multiply to make new copies. Viruses, they don't divide, they make new copies from a pool of components. Now, uh, talking about how are uh, viruses different from other forms of life, uh, they cannot uh, generate energy because uh, they do not have mitochondria. They do not make their membranes, but uh, there are some viruses that can uh, acquire membrane from their host cells. They cannot manufacture their proteins, but uh, they have uh, genetic material uh, that can code for their protein and they use the host cell machinery to uh, manufacture their proteins. All uh, cells and organisms that we know of uh, use uh, double-stranded DNA as their genetic material, but uh, viruses can have uh, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded DNA, and uh, double-stranded DNA as their uh, genetic material. So uh, they are actually more uh, diverse uh, genetically as compared to other organisms. So uh, this is just to give you all an idea of how small uh, viruses are. Rice has uh, 60,000 genes, uh, Homo sapiens has uh, 24,000 genes, E. coli bacteria has 4,200 genes, and uh, here are uh, viruses which have uh, less than 200, uh, even 10 and uh, 3 genes. Uh, so uh, we all know that we cannot see uh, viruses, uh, not even under uh, light microscope. The only time we can see them is under electron microscope. So uh, virus actually look like this under electron microscope. So a uh, majority of uh, plant viruses, they are transmitted from plant to plant by insect vectors. Only fewer plant viruses are transmitted uh, by other methods such as um, uh, seeds through vegetative propagation, uh, fungi, nematode, and uh, sap. So there are four uh, modes or ways by which uh, insects transmit viruses. Uh, first one, non-persistent, which is a uh, stylet bone. It is uh, mostly by aphids. Uh, one of the most common example for this is uh, cucumber mosaic virus. Uh, so uh, an aphid go and uh, feed on uh, infected plant and move to the healthy plant and infect that plant. So this process is very quick, uh, takes only seconds to acquire the virus and minutes to, uh, to inoculate or transmit it to a healthy plant. But, uh, they, but they do not stay inside the vector uh, for a long time. Uh, second one, semi-persistent, which is a uh, forgot burn. It, is, uh, it, is, it takes slightly longer. It takes minutes to uh, acquire the virus and hours to inoculate it uh, to a healthy plant. Both of these uh, types, uh, non-persistent sem and semi-persistent, they uh, do not present in the vector's hemolym. They uh, do not multiply inside the vector and uh, there is no uh, transvarial uh, transmission. The next two types, persistent circulative and persistent propagative, they are uh, slightly complicated. Uh, persistent circulative, which is INSV type, uh, it takes hours to uh, acquire the virus and days to uh, transmit it to a healthy plant. And their latent period is for hours or days. It means they take hours and days, uh, insect takes hours and days to become uh, virulifers and be able to uh, transmit the virus. Uh, and they can stay inside the vector for days, for weeks, and even the whole uh, lifespan of the insect. Uh, both of these two, persistent circulative and uh, persistent propagative, they are present in the vector's hemolin. And only the uh, persistent propagative type is the one that, uh, which is the tomato spotted wild virus type, uh, that can only multiply inside the vector. And uh, with the uh, Persistent circulated type, which is INSV type, uh, the infected mother offspring uh, can, uh, they do not pass the virus or do not pass the infection to their offspring. 
while uh, persistent propagative type, which is uh, tomato spotted wilt virus type, uh, the mother uh, infected mother uh, thrips they uh, they they actually uh, transmit the virus uh, to their offspring. These are the few examples of uh, each type of virus transmission. Uh, so moving on to INSV, uh, impatience necrotic spot orthotospo virus. It is uh, one of the most economically important uh, plant viruses. Uh, belongs to the family orthotospo viridae and uh, order uh, bunia virens. In addition to INSV, other uh, economically important uh, tospo viruses belonging to the same family and order are tomato spotted wilt virus, tomato chloritic spot virus, and uh, soya bean vein uh, necrosis virus. This is the structure of INSV. I will not go into the details of its genetic material, just to keep it in brief. It's a RNA virus, a ribonucleic acid virus, uh, that consists of three uh, segments or uh, three uh, RNA fragments, uh, S small, uh, medium, and uh, L uh, large segments. These segments are uh, embedded with protein, and all of this is uh, wrapped in a lipid uh, envelope. Uh, this is in contrast to uh, plant viruses, which have a protein shell, uh, but uh, no lipid envelope. An explanation for this uh, different structure could be that uh, TOSPO virus uh, originated as an insect virus uh, that uh, later on become uh, well adapted uh, to the plant. Another point I would like to uh, mention here is that uh, these uh, TOSPO viruses can cause uh, more or less similar symptoms. Therefore, it is uh, very important to uh, properly uh, diagnose them. Western flower thrips or Franklinilla occidentalis. Uh, this is our chief contributor. Uh, so all uh, TOSPO viruses are uh, transmitted by at least uh, one species of uh, thrips. Host range for thrips is quite large and is uh, known to uh, feed on over hundreds and hundreds of uh, different uh, plant species, including vegetables, ornamentals, and uh, fruit crops. It also uh, colonizes and uh, reproduces on uh, several weed species. Little about uh, their biology. Uh, they are incredibly small insects, about uh, one to two uh, millimeter in length. Females are uh, highly reproductive and can lay uh, hundreds of egg uh, throughout her lifetime. And, and the life cycle from egg to adult can range depending on temperature, uh, nutrition, and uh, environmental conditions. Uh, but in ideal condition, it takes uh, 13 days or uh, less uh, to develop from egg to all the way uh, to an adult. An important thing about thrips is that uh, they are poor flyers and uh, they heavily, uh, because they do not have uh, true wings, and they heavily rely on uh, wind for their uh, dispersal. Western flower thrips and acquisition of uh, virus, INSV. Uh, so thrips exhibit uh, three different type of life stages. Uh, eggs are uh, laid uh, within the leaf. Uh, so the female uh, inject eggs underneath the leaf surface of an infected plant. Eggs uh, then develop into the feeding stage, uh, first star or uh, second star larva. Larva then uh, undergo pupation and uh, develop into a non-feeding stage, uh, pupa and uh, pro-pupa. Uh, this is a soil uh, dwelling stage and uh, they are primarily uh, limited uh, to the soil layer. Pupa then uh, develop into an adult. So for uh, transmission, virus uh, must be acquired uh, during this uh, larval stage in order for an adult to uh, transmit it to a plant. Uh, only the adults can uh, transmit the virus. Uh, larva cannot uh, transmit the virus. They can only uh, acquire it. Uh, so this is uh, answer to uh, one of my question. Only larva can acquire the virus. So uh, when the female, um, female thrips uh, lay the eggs again into a different plant, that egg uh, does not uh, have the virus. They have to um, uh, reacquire it every single time or uh, every single generation as the first instar or second instar uh, larva. Moving on to the host range. INSV was first described on lettuce in uh, 1997 in Italy. In uh, United States, uh, first report of the disease came in 2006 from Monterey County, California. From uh, 2007 to uh, 17, INSV was there, though low disease incidences were uh, recorded, but it was uh, steady increasing. 
from uh, 2018 to 2021, INSV became uh, established in the Monterey County and other uh, coastal lettuce regions with a significant increase year after year with a huge uh, crop losses. And the sad part is that INSV can infect over uh, 600 uh, different plant species and among them ornamentals are the most common host. Uh, in fact, historically, INSV was considered uh, to be a pathogen primarily of ornamentals. This is a list of, uh, in fact, very list of ornamentals infected by INSP. Ornamentals are uh, their favorite host. So uh, we all know that INSP in lettuce has been a big problem in uh, Salinas, in the coastal part of California, especially uh, during the last couple of years from 2018 to 2021. Uh, then the disease started uh, showing up in the desert, uh, especially in the Yuma region in, uh, in actually uh, early March in uh, several uh, romaine and uh, iceberg uh, lettuce field. Initially, incidences were reported from Tecna, Roll, and uh, Welton regions. Uh, later on, uh, positive samples were also collected from Bard, Imperial, and uh, Coquilla regions. The uh, symptomatic uh, lettuce plants were uh, collected and uh, tested for INSP, and uh, they were uh, found to be uh, positive for the virus. Uh, moving on to symptoms of INSP. So uh, plants can become infected with INSV at uh, any age, though infections in the earlier stage of uh, development usually results in uh, more uh, pronounced symptoms uh, that include stunted growth and uh, severely distorted leaves. Initial symptoms appear as uh, irregular shape, uh, brown spots or uh, lesions, often associated with uh, veins. Uh, symptoms then expands into larger uh, necrotic sections and uh, wilting. Plants infected at the seedling through a rosette stage show severe stunting and uh, do not form uh, marketable heads. So uh, these symptoms are also typical of another uh, TOSPO virus, uh, TSWV, tomato spotted wilt virus. Therefore, it is uh, very important to uh, properly uh, diagnose them. And I want to highlight this point, how important proper diagnosis is, uh, because sometimes uh, looking at the symptoms, you can say it's INSB, but uh, when you test them, it turns out to be negative. Therefore, it is uh, very important to properly test them, either through uh, immunostrips, serological assays, or uh, through uh, molecular assays. After these reports, percent uh, disease incidence and how much the disease was uh, progressing every week uh, was uh, recorded. And it was observed that overall the uh, average disease incidence was low with uh, less number of thrips also. Uh, so the question uh, comes up, uh, what are the sources of uh, thrips or INSV in the Dejer, in the in Yuma? So uh, it was illustrated that uh, probably it came uh, with the transplants or the infected uh, plant material uh, or uh, with the infected uh, thrips uh, coming in with the transplants. After these reports, a survey was conducted by Dr. Palumbo's um, group uh, to monitor thrips on a desert crop. And it was observed that alpha-alpha had the uh, highest uh, number of thrips. Uh, which is apparent uh, as uh, thrips are attracted to yellow, purple, and uh, blue flowers, followed by uh, cotton, weeds, uh, wheat, and uh, Sudan grass, while uh, melons had the uh, lowest uh, number of thrips. In order to uh, further assess what else out there uh, could be acting as a host uh, for the virus to uh, live over the summer and infect the lettuce crop uh, during fall, Another survey was uh, conducted by uh, Dr. Selinsky group uh, from March through June, and uh, crops such as uh, alfalfa, cotton, and uh, melons were uh, collected and uh, tested for INSV. It was observed that uh, none of the crop uh, tested uh, positive for the virus. All uh, samples were confirmed with uh, ELISA and uh, EGDA immunostrips. Uh, so to uh, determine whether these uh, crops act as a uh, host for the virus over the summer, transmission studies are uh, necessary. I'm showing these slides by Dr. Silinski and Dr. Polombo to build a story or the rationale uh, behind the objectives of uh, my INSP project. So uh, with this in background, I laid out uh, two objectives to study the epidemiology to manage INSV in Arizona. 
This is a two-year project funded by Arizona Department of uh, Agriculture Specialty Crop Log Grant. My uh, first objective is to screen ornamentals uh, for the virus in uh, Yuma and uh, nearby areas. We were also supposed to screen weed species for the uh, virus, but since Dr. Selinsky group is already investigating it, uh, there's no point in uh, doing that twice. So we skip that part and only be focusing on ornamentals. My uh, second objective is to conduct transmission studies on crops such as alfalfa, melon, and uh, cotton to determine if these crops act as a host uh, for the virus or not. For my first objective, I am uh, collecting ornamentals from uh, Yuma County and uh, nearby areas and uh, testing them for uh, INSV using ELISA and uh, RT-PCR assays. I am collecting samples from uh, Yuma and uh, nearby areas from uh, greenhouses, open field nurseries. And if any one of you want to test the sample for INSV, you can uh, bring it to us. We test them for free using immunostrips. And if you want to bring samples in bulk, like hundreds of samples, then you are more than welcome to bring them. I would be happy to test them using uh, serological assays or through RT-PCR, as they are a bit more economic as compared to using uh, immunostrips. So I uh, tested uh, some samples of uh, Catherinthus geranium petunia and uh, Wogenvillea from Home Depot uh, using ELISA assay, and they were uh, found to be uh, negative for the virus. To uh, assess the properties of virus and to determine whether uh, summer crops act as a host for the virus, uh, I am doing transmission studies, uh, both uh, SAP and uh, THRIPS transmission. First, I will discuss about SAP or uh, mechanical transmission. Uh, so, um, SAP was prepared by uh, grinding INSV infected uh, lattice leaves in uh, potassium phosphate buffer. The uh, sap was then rubbed onto carborundum, carborundum dusted uh, leaves of a two to three true leaf stage uh, healthy plant. Carborundum was uh, used as an abrasive. Inoculated plants were then kept in the greenhouse uh, and observed for symptoms after uh, five to seven days uh, post inoculation. The uh, plants were then tested for INSV using ELISA and uh, RT PCR assays. For uh, transmission studies, uh, 20 individually potted plants of each crop, lattice, alfalfa, cotton, melon, and beans were used for sap inoculation, while uh, five were uh, kept as control. Plants were observed until uh, symptoms appear or up to uh, 30 days uh, post inoculation. It was observed that out of 20 lettuce plants inoculated with sap, 16 plants developed spots uh, by uh, seven days post inoculation, followed by chlorosis and mottling. Eventually, these plants developed uh, necrosis and uh, died. They also tested uh, positive with uh, both ELISA and uh, RT PCR assays. Uh, I will talk about RT-PCR uh, in my next slide. In contrast, crops such as uh, melons, beans, alfalfa, and cotton did not uh, develop any symptoms of INSV even after uh, 30 days uh, post-inoculation, nor uh, did they show uh, positive results uh, with the ELISA assay. So uh, before making or reaching to any conclusion, I would want to repeat these uh, transmission studies two more times in uh, two independent experiments to uh, reach, uh, reach any conclusion whether these uh, crops act as a host uh, for the virus or not. After uh, ELISA, INSV infection in uh, lettuce plants was uh, further characterized molecularly using RT-PCR or uh, reverse transcription PCR. Total RNA was extracted from the leaf tissue and uh, RT-PCR was performed with uh, three primer pairs. As expected, primer pair designed from NSM gene was uh, able to amplify a single uh, 900 base pair amplicon in all the 16 uh, lettuce plants that showed uh, symptoms of INSV and also tested positive uh, with the ELISA assay. Uh, likewise, a uh, primer pair designed from NSS gene was uh, able to amplify a single uh, 1350 base pair amplicon. And the primer sets designed from N gene was uh, able to amplify a single uh, 960 base pair amplicon in all the 16 uh, lettuce plants. To, uh, 
to further investigate the potential of uh, summer crops to serve as uh, an INSP inoculum, I am doing uh, thrips transmission studies. Uh, this is a flow chart uh, showing step-by-step -step process of uh, transmission uh, through thrips. First step in this uh, process is to rear uh, thrips colonies in the lab, uh, which I'm doing now. Uh, next is uh, to generate uh, viruliferous adult uh, thrips. For that, uh, pools of uh, first instar larva will be uh, collected with a fine brush and uh, allowed to feed on INSV infected uh, lettuce leaves. Uh, or allowed to acquire the virus from uh, INSV infected uh, lettuce leaves. Uh, remember, only the larva can uh, acquire the virus. Uh, larva will then be reared on uh, cabbage until uh, becoming adults. After acquisition is uh, transmission. Uh, viruliferous adult thrips, about 20 to 30, they will be placed on the leaves of healthy one to true uh, leaf stage alpha alpha cotton and melon plants and uh, will be given an inoculation excess period. Uh, both of these uh, steps, acquisition and transmission, will be performed in uh, plastic containers with a lid having a hole uh, covered with a nylon mesh. After inoculation excess period, plants will be incubated in the growth chambers or uh, incubators uh, for about uh, two weeks and uh, will then be tested for uh, INSV using uh, ELISA and RT-PCR assays. Thrips transmission studies will be performed in uh, growth chambers or uh, incubators. Uh, these are the plants uh, growing in the growth chambers. It was uh, observed that for lettuce, 22 degrees Celsius temperature with 10 hour dark, 14 hour light cycle works best. For alfalfa, melon and beans, 29 degrees Celsius temperature with 9 hour dark, 15 hour light uh, cycle works fine. And uh, for cotton, a uh, little higher temperature, 32 uh, degrees Celsius with 8 hour uh, dark, 16 hour light cycle works uh, best. Moving on to thrips rearing in the lab. Uh, so due to the small size and uh, life cycle of thrips, they tend to be less forgiving when uh, rearing mistakes are made uh, relative to the other uh, insect species commonly uh, read uh, in the laboratory. Uh, it, it was observed that to uh, maintain timely predictable emergence uh, maturity and OV position, the optimum rearing condition for uh, thrips are 27 degrees Celsius temperature, 40 to 60% relative humidity and at least uh, 12 hours of uh, light exposure uh, per day. About their diet, uh, thrips can be successfully reared on uh, green beans uh, or cabbage leaves. I am uh, rearing them on cabbage leaves because they are uh, less prone to mold and uh, presence of insecticide residues. This is a picture of adult thrips on uh, cabbage leaf. Like uh, SEP transmission, uh, thrips transmission studies will also be performed in three independent experiments. And in each experiment, 20 individually potted uh, plants of uh, each crop will be used for uh, thrips inoculation, while uh, five will uh, serve as control. Based on the background, we can devise an integrated pest management strategy for uh, management of uh, thrips and INSV in uh, lettuce in Arizona. Uh, this strategy focuses on uh, three major stages, before planting, during the cropping season, and uh, after harvest. In the first strategy, what we can do is um, obtain and plant a thrips-free transplant. Uh, second, uh, control weeds in and around a lettuce field. Uh, third, evaluate planting location and uh, time of planting, like uh, if possible, avoid hotspots and planting near the field with the bridge crops. And a fourth option is to plant INSV resistant varieties. Uh, this may not be required if all other uh, practices are followed. Second strategy to follow is uh, during the cropping season. Uh, first in this strategy is uh, to monitor uh, field for thrips with yellow sticky card uh, to assess when thrips population begin to increase. Uh, second, uh, manage thrips with insecticide. Third, uh, monitor field for INSV and remove any infected plant uh, early in the development and when disease incidence is low. Fourth is uh, continue managing uh, weeds in and around uh, lettuce field. Last strategy to follow is uh, after harvest. 
Um, again, in this strategy, first is to control weeds and fallow fields and non-crop land uh, close to the next year lattice field. And a second is to promptly remove and destroy uh, plants after harvest. We have a plant diagnostic clinic. All you have to do is, uh, if you want to bring in sample, you can bring into a, our lab. All you have to do is fill in this form, fill in your contact information, host plant and symptom information, plant production and practices. Uh, this form is available online and uh, also at the Yuma X Center and uh, Yuma County Cooperative Extension Office. And if you are bringing uh, samples from outside Arizona, then please remember to include the USDA permit form, which is also uh, available online. With this, I would like to thank Dr. Podel uh, for providing me an opportunity to investigate the epidemiology of outbreaks of INSP in Arizona. I would also like to thank our lab members, Martin and uh, Jason, uh, for their assistance. And thank you all of you for taking the time to attend my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions if you may have.